So our next speaker is Michael Stout from the Oklahoma Center uh, for Euroscience. And um, is that better? Yes, that looks perfect. Okay. Uh, also from the Oklahoma University Health Science Center. And uh, the talk of uh, talk title is estrogen receptor A is required for 17A estradiol to modulate health parameters. So I would just remind everyone again to please pose any question for Michael in the chat function and we will take them afterwards. So please, Michael, go ahead. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, sounds perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, again, my name is Michael Stout. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And today I will talk about 17-alpha uh, estradiol's effects in uh, human cells and um, rodent models. But the overarching theme of our lab is really sex differences and um, metabolism and aging and what role sex hormones play. And so I know we're on a clock here, so if anything's not clear, please feel free to shoot me an email. I'll put that here at the bottom. There we go. Okay, so as a quick reminder, about 80% of circulating beta estradiol is created in the granulosa cells of the ovary in females. And as everyone knows, this goes out and has major endocrine actions throughout the body. Conversely, males only produce about 20% of their circulating beta estradiol in the Sertoli cells of the testes. And it's really unclear what role these, these, this pool of estrogens has or plays in terms of an endocrine actions. However, it's exceedingly clear that in females, when you eliminate this 80% of circulating pool in diseases such as polycystic ovarian syndrome or in conditions such as menopause, this has del deleterious effects that lead to chronic conditions such as obesity, liver diseases, metabolic dysfunction, osteoporosis, et cetera. Again, it's really unclear if we were to eliminate this 20% of production by the male testes, what role this has in chronic disease and aging. However, it is very well known that estrogens are playing a role in male metabolism and probably aging as well. And so if we were to block, well, this has been done now in humans, if you block aromatase um, pharmacologically, these men increase their adiposity, or if you uh, modulate ER alpha activity in male rodents, you get a modulation of gluconeogenesis and lipid metabolism, which appears to be regulated by FOXO1 in the liver. More recent data is showing that a nuclear or membrane ER alpha or genomic or non-genomic actions of ER alpha appear to be different between the sexes. And so this seems to play a role in insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. So it appears that the vast majority of estrogen actions in all these tissues are occurring in males through aromatization of androgens to beta estradiol, which has autocrine, paracrine, and incretin actions on these tissues. However, more recent data is now showing that males also have the ability to express steratogenic acute regulatory protein, which is the rate limiting enzyme responsible for de novo steroid biosynthesis. And so it's really unclear at this point what is going on with regards to local estrogen actions in this role in aging within these tissues in males. And so this is kind of how we wound up in the 17 officer dial field. I gotta get this out of here. And so this is a naturally occurring enantiomer, a beta estradiol. It has minimal binding affinity for ER alpha and ER beta, which has led many to believe that this has its own novel receptor. Although through this publication, I think we've shown that at least with regards to a lot of the stuff that we study, we believe this is through ER alpha and not a novel receptor. It's also currently prescribed as a hair loss therapy in Europe and um, South America under the under the name uh, Pantostin, and it accounts for about 10% of Premarin, which is a hormone replacement therapy that has kind of fallen out of favor, but it's been prescribed for decades. It came to be known in the aging field due to its neuroprotective effects related to uh, models of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And that's been uh, studied for the past, we'll say 30 years. But 
more recently, there's a belief that this estrogen provided exogenously may have a role in systemic aging. And this first came about when the interventions testing program here in the US as part of the NIA was able to determine that when you provide this estrogen at two different doses, it extends median and maximal lifespan, but only in males. And so there's probably a story here as well as to why the females are not responsive, which we believe has to do with competition between endogenous beta estradiol and exogenous alpha estradiol. But we don't have time to discuss that today, so I'll just talk about the effects in males. My computer keeps freezing. There we go. Okay, so when we saw these longevity curves, we certainly wanted to understand if this is affecting hallmarks of aging in a tissue-specific manner, and is this reversing or can it reverse obesity-related comorbid conditions? and what this could tell us about systemic aging biology. And so we don't really have time to go over all these. We published a series of papers showing that when you provide this estrogen to male rodents, you have a, a myriad of beneficial effects, first starting with reductions in calorie intake. However, I must say that all of these benefits are not totally contingent upon reductions in food intake. If we use hyperphagic models, or we do KCAL matching, a lot of these benefits are still present. And these include reductions in adiposity, particularly visceral or central adiposity, fatty liver disease, liver fibrosis, hepatocyte DNA damage, improvements in glucose homeostasis and insulin sensitivity, and a shifting of the polarity on monocytes and macrophages to more of a surveillance and repair type of uh, phenotype. We've also started looking at B cells and it seems that there's a phenotype is there in there as well. However, these are all fairly descriptive and we still at this time did not know what the signaling mechanism was or if this is acting through a specific tissue, thereby having or leading to systemic benefits on aging biology. And so the first thing that we wanted to try to do in this, in this paper that we were fortunate enough to get in eLife was determine whether or not 17 alpha estradiol and 17 beta estradiol elicit divergent effects or genomic effects with ER alpha. And so we took U2OS bone carcinoma cells, which are a human cell line that don't express any estrogen receptors. And then we transfected them with ER alpha. And then we hit them with 17 alpha at two different doses or 17 beta estradiol and look to see where ER alpha is going to bind and genomic locations. And is what we find is that regardless of ligand or dose, it's going to the same places. And the magnitude with which it's binding is almost identical, regardless of dose or ligand. And when we look at specific binding motifs is what we find is a lot of the common estrogen related response elements are coming up, including ERE's, estrogen related receptor or response elements, seroidogenic factor one. And again, regardless of ligand or dose, they're essentially identical. So we repeated this and did the exact kind of experiment and looked at transcriptomics. And as what we found is that all of the treatment samples cluster together away from the vehicle and the differentially expressed genes, including upward and downward, are again, essentially identical, regardless of dose or ligand. And this is just a representation of the gene body and where ER alpha is binding. Again, these are essentially the same. And so the take home point from these first two panels are, or is that there is no difference, at least with regards to genomic activity through ER alpha, whether or not you have ER alpha or ER beta as your ligand. So we then went on to look at uh, global ER alpha or estrogen receptor alpha knockout mice to see if this can ablate the effects of this estrogen. And I took out a lot of panels from the paper to try to make this easier to follow. But the take home point here is that pink, which is the knockout receiving the estrogen versus the light blue, which is the wild type receiving the estrogen, these curves diverge. And so there's certainly an ablative effect of removing ER alpha on this estrogen with regard to mass, fat mass, and KCAL intake. And so this tells us that ER alpha is at least regulating these three specific um, phenotypes that are elicited by this estrogen. 
when we look at metabolic homeostasis, we see the same thing. Insulin goes down significantly in the wild type, so does A1C, but this is not seen in the knockouts. The same can be said for glucose tolerance. The wild types come down significantly, so much so that they mimic what's going on in the low fat diet control group, despite weighing about 15 grams more. So they're obese, but they're highly glucose tolerant and likely insulin sensitive. And so we use liver disease in a rodent model as kind of a readout of, of um, metabolic dysfunction because they have such a large liver. And it's what we find is that, as I've shown before, the estrogen reduces fatty liver disease and fibrosis. But when we repeated this in this model, the wild types respond and the knockouts do not. And you see this both qualitatively through oral red O and quantitatively through fatty acid and triglyceride quantification. When we look at liver fibrosis through trichrome staining, and then we also have looked at um, um, serious red and hydroxyproline, you see that the wild types respond and the knockouts do not. Again, suggesting that the effects of 17 alpha estradiol are dependent upon ER alpha, which could tell us something about what ER alpha is, is doing with regards to aging in males. And these are just fibrotic markers at the transcriptional level that somewhat mimic what we see um, from histology. And so given this very strong association between hepatic insulin sensitivity and metabolic regulation and the emergence of fatty liver disease and fibrosis, we thought that the way to prove this was to determine whether or not this is affecting hepatic insulin sensitivity. And so the first thing that we did was just take these livers and look at genes that have been closely linked to hepatic insulin sensitivity in rodents. And as what we find is that this estrogen reduces folostatin, inhibin, and IRS2 significantly in the wild types, but not the knockouts. This also reverses some of the obesity-related changes in gluconeogenic enzymes. Or These are at the transcript level, though. So then we thought as a direct measure, we should feed another set of mice, get them sick with high-fat diet, and then provide the estrogen or just maintain them on the high fat diet and then inject them with insulin prior to um, dissection so that we could test the effects of hepatic insulin sensitivity through looking at AKT and FOXO1. And as what we find is that the estrogen works or improves hepatic insulin sensitivity as measured by AKT phosphorylation and FOXO1 phosphorylation, but only in the wild types and not the knockouts. So we thought, okay, the last way to prove this is to provide this estrogen acutely so we can circumvent the effects of um, reductions in food intake. So we just infuse this very acutely and then we perform a hyperinsulinemic glycemic clamp. And as what this is, is an infusion of high insulin and then that's, that's clamped, it's consistent. And then you have a variable rate of glucose infusion to maintain your glycemia. So the higher amount of glucose that you have to infuse, the more insulin sensitive the whole animal is. And then you can look at rate of appearance due to labeled or unlabeled glucose and rate of disappearance and tell you whether or not this is peripheral tissue versus liver. And as what we find is when we infuse this estrogen under hyperinsulinemic conditions, glucose infusion rates go up, indicating that the animal is more insulin sensitive. And this is due to a massive suppression of endogenous glucose production or gluconeogenesis. And so, but the rate of disappearance is unchanged. So in this top group of experiments here is what this is telling us is that indeed, hepatic insulin sensitivity is improved when we acutely provide this estrogen. But since there has been a, an established connection between the hypothalamus and the liver in regulating systemic glucose homeostasis, we thought we should also infuse this into the brain at very minor doses to see what happens and to make sure, we thought, that this would not have an effect on hepatic gluconeogenesis. It turns out that when we infuse this into the brain, it phenocopies what we showed in A through E with increased glucose infusion rates, a suppression of hepatic glucose production, and no change in the rate of peripheral disposal. So as what we learned from this is, that this estrogen is probably multimodal in its actions. It's probably crossing the blood-brain barrier and affecting the hypothalamus. There is an established connection between AGRP neurons and the regulation of hepatic gluconeogenesis. And there's more emerging data suggesting that POMC neurons can do this as well.
And so as what we're in the process of doing now is trying to figure out whether this is a direct action in the liver or indirect actions on the liver by actions in the hypothalamus. And so we're in the process of removing ER alpha throughout the hypothalamus or in specific neurons or in hepatocytes and stellate cells. We're also trying to snip this crosstalk between the two to try to tease this out for one to tell us how 17 alpha estradiol is working, but more importantly, tell us what this may or what role this may play in male aging. And so I think I'm probably slightly over my time here. So I want to mention Shivani Mann here first. She is a fantastic graduate student in the lab and she ran most of these studies. Here's the rest of my lab, Rashini, Caitlin, Samim, and Kennedy. Uh, the primary collaborators associated with this project were John, Sabu, and Derek, and Bill Freeman locally. And then certainly I would like to thank all of my funding sources for supporting this work. And at this point, I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. I think you're perfectly on time. Uh, really interesting. So maybe I can start with posing some questions. Um, so you're really targeting some of the sex specific effects in aging, I guess here, because you're only studying male mice, right? Yeah, I didn't mention that. So we have females in this study. The females, we have them in most studies. We didn't initially because we just wanted to see what the phenotype would be in males. Since then, we, we include females in everything, but, and they're in this paper as well, but it's, it's very complex and there's competition between endogenous alpha and endogenous, uh, I'm sorry, exogenous alpha and endogenous beta estradiol. And in the context of OBX, we do see that this estrogen works. And so we don't know if that's because it's replacing some of what the beta estradiol is doing endogenously, or if it's eliciting some other, that's what we think, or if it's eliciting some other effect that is replacing what the over, what, such as a microRNA, because there's some belief that the ovaries are producing microRNAs that are having systemic effects. And so we're in the process of teasing that out, whether that is, um, so we're not just doing OVX, we're also doing VCD menopause induction in, in female mice and providing this estrogen to see if that, um, if we can un uncouple these kind of things, if that makes any sense. Right. So, I mean, is it then possible to, for the male mice to kind of catch up with the female mice on some of the, these phenotypes that you're studying? Yeah, that's a good question. Certainly they do. And, and, and so this is where the interventions testing program gets really in, interested in this because they, when you provide this estrogen to males, their argument is that these males live longer than the females do. But there's, in my personal opinion, there's a lot of variables at play there. Yes, you, but the dosing has to be, and the binding affinity and the activity of ER alpha has to be equal to determine whether or not, you know what I mean? We have to dose ER alpha or 17 alpha accordingly to mimic the endogenous 17 beta effect to really make those comparisons. And so I don't know if that answers your question. I know I get tangential, but that, that's kind of the way we're thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand it's complex. Uh, so we have some more questions here. One from Amanda Neo. Is there a role of GPER in the effects of 17 alpha estradiol? Great question. So yeah, GPR30 or GPR, yes. So we're familiar with it. We tried, um, we've done a little bit. And so we, we looked at, um, so this is a membrane receptor that is, that is been linked to estrogen signaling. And so we are aware of it. And we've, we've, we've taken cells that we know express it and we've hit them with this estrogen and we've done RNA-seq to try to figure out if we, if we can get any readouts that would be indicative of GPR activity. And we haven't found any, but we haven't, to be honest, we have not went super high in depth to try to figure this out because of the, what we've seen with ER alpha ablation. And, um, but to answer you directly, we've tested a little bit. We don't have any evidence to suggest at this point that it is signaling through GPR. Right, so maybe time for one last quick question. Um, so this is from Dario. Uh, great talk, Michael. Why don't males tune 17-alpha-E2 to improve their metabolic aging? 
and what's the cost on the male's end for doing this? So, so say that again, I'm sorry. So that Why don't males tune the 17 alpha to improve their metabolic aging? I can't see the question. Why do they chew? I didn't. It's, it's in the panelists and attendees. So, okay, so let's do it like this. You can, you can read a comment and maybe you can um, type an answer. I'm trying to get to uh, it. That one. It's in the chat function. So I think it's it's time to move on. So you can read the chat function in the yeah chat yeah. The Sorry, Dario. I'll, I'm, I just got it to pull up. So I will definitely uh, shoot you a message real quick. Sorry, I didn't get it. No problem. Thank you very much, Michael. Great talk. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So let's move on to the next speaker. It's Yang Lui from the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology and Geriatric Center at the University of Michigan in the US. So your talk title is Serotonin 2A Receptor Signaling Coordinates Central Metabolic Processes to Modulate Aging in Response to Nutrient Choice. And you have um, started to share your screen. Yes, perfect. Thank perfect. you, Yang, and please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. Uh, first, I want to thank Eli for hosting such excellent symposium. Uh, again, my name is Yang, and I'm postdoc from the Scott Fletcher Lab at the University of Michigan. And the story I'm going to talk about today is about food choice, serotonin signaling, and aging in food fights. As many of you already know, doubt is arguably one of the most important determinants of aging. Early in 1935, McKay and his colleagues for the first time found that the restriction of calories without malnutrition promotes lifespan in rats compared with their adult fat siblings. Then it almost took 17 years until we realized that Beyond the calories, dietary composition is su sufficient to modulate aging thanks to the studies on isochlorical diets and the nutritional geometric framework. As a matter of fact, in recent two decades, increased evidence in indicates many of aspects of diets influence aging and health, including food perception, meal time, and many others. Today, I'm going to focus on how food choice influences aging. Food choice is natural. Animals seek carbs and proteins to satisfy their energy demand all the time. On top of choosing specific nutrients, humans also make food choices based on taste and flavor. For example, here I show you a traditional Chinese hot pot, always put at two divided wells, so people can choose from two different broths to make their own meal. In our lab, we have designed a new choice style paradigm, which is not inspired by Chinese hot pots, but the idea is similar. For food fries, sugar and yeast are two major macronutrients, while yeast is the primary protein source. We separate sugar and yeast into two different wells, as you can uh, see here, um, so animals can construct their own meal. This is different from the conventional fixed styles where you have no choice but to eat chunk of nutrient mix. What we have found here is that food choice can dramatically reduce lifespan in both males and females as shown in dashed lines compared to their siblings that fit on a fixed style, and that has the same concentration and of nutrients. We have validated this choice effects in several different white type flies, including two white strains collected from the orchards in Pennsylvania and see the similar results. While the effects are usually bigger in males, as shown here, the following parts of the presentation will be focusing on the male data. N now we know flies live shorter on a choice doubt. The first thing we ask is that do these flies live shorter because they choose a poor meal? So we measure the food consumptions of flies living in these two different dietary environments. We observe flies eat the same amount of yeast, but about nine times more sugar when they fed on a choice diet. From previous studies, we knew that high sugar diet is probably detrimental to longevity, but is that why choice diets reduce flies' lifespan? 
to answer this question, we added two high sugar uh, fixed styles as controls. Although they have a slightly different sugar to its ratio, we can see from the feeding data below that both diets up approximates the nutritional composition that finds it on the true styles. With that, we can test whether the true lifespan effects are from the differences in sugar intake. In fact, we show that the effects of dietary choice relative to standard S Y ten diets are much bigger than that from homogeneous high sugar diets, which are shown as purple and red lines. The lifespan and the feeding data in this slide together implies that nutrient decisions significantly influence aging in a manner that is at least partially independent of sugar intake. So far, our observations suggest that animals respond differently to macronutrients depending on how are they are presented and that effects of choice on lifespan may be mediated by processes that are independent of macronutrient intake. Then what is the cause and the mechanisms of aging in the choice environment? Our lab has been interested in neurotransmitters and neuron peptides that are required for nutrient perception, as we hypothesized that neuronal signaling is important modulator of aging. One of the screen we have been using is to put flies in the two choice feeding paradigm as shown here and see which mutants alter the food preferences. Now the data I show you here is from our publication also on eLife back in 2016, where our pre-graduate student Jenny Rowe in our lab found flies will adjust the macronutrients preference based on internal needs. So in a truth essay, fully fried flies always go for sugar after starvation, flies will switch to yeast, suggesting nutrient decisions are dynamic processes driven by internal state. Jenny also found a mutation in serotonin receptor 2A, also called 5H2A, uh, abolish this switch. This data suggests that 5H2A mediates either internal energy demands or external nutrient sensing or both. And we're interested in whether this molecule identified by this short-term assay can modulate aging in the long-term choice environment. And indeed, we found the lifespan differences between a fixed and choice environments are fully abrogated in the 582A mutants in the perfect way, as shown in the blue lines. Um, in addition to genetic mutants, I also use other approaches to validate the involvement of 5H2A to convince myself as well as to convince you because 5H2A is highly expressed in the center neuron system. We use the pan neuron driver ELVB gl 4 to knock down 5H2A expression. And we observe that this manipulation abrogates the choice effects using one of the ion allies as shown in the center and significantly reduce the effects of the second as shown in the right. We also found an administration of Puron Peron 5H2A antagonist during the adult stage is sufficient to reduce the choice effects. Together, this data suggests that neuronal expression of 5H2A in adults mediates the dietary effect. Our previous feeding data has shown that 5H2A modulates protein drive after starvation. So we asked whether it might change nutrient consumption in fat flies. Here we show that 5H2A mutants exhibit actually similar nutrient preference uh, compared to control flies in the choice environments. They both consumed significantly more sugar, sucrose than yeast when given choice, as shown here. And in addition, video tracking data also suggests both genotypes actually spent most of the time, surprisingly, on the east side, um, as shown here. Uh, this indicates a 5-HCA does not influence how flies interact with the food environment when in a homeostatic state. Where serotonin doesn't change the way fly interacts with the food environment, it does have a significant influence on lifespan. 
which make me think that 5-HCA might alter the nutrient integration inside of the body and changes on the level might be sufficient um, to affect aging. To investigate this, we use metabolomics to examine the metabolic changes in flies. Here we study both control flies and 5-HCA mutants in heads and bodies. This work is collaborated with the Daniel Pomes lab at the University of Washington. From this study, we found a consistent upregulation of some TCA intermediates and amino acids that induced by choice in Y types, which are fully abrogates in the mutants. For example, alpha ketone glutrate and its precursor um, glutamate, glut, uh, glutamine are both increased in the head. We further investigate the direct role of biochemical reactions that produce the TCA metabolites in the modulation of aging in response to dietary choice. So we look, uh, we targeted knockdown expression of this enzyme, glutamate dehydrogenase or GDH, which converts glutamate to alpha ketone glutrate. Uh, here we, uh, we used RU486 dependent gene switch system to knock down GDH ubiquitously. On the left, the controls where RU is not added and flies are short sure left on the choice just as white type flies. On the right, where the RNI insertion has been activated by RU, the lifespan differences between our uh, two environments are abrogated. This data suggests a causal link between alpha ketone glutrate and the choice lifespan effect. Here, I hope I convince you with this model uh, where nutritional environment modulates metabolic states in periphery through 5 hca in brain, which further determines lifespan. I speculate that in the choice environment, serotonin cycling turns the animals into energy burning mode, which shortens their lifespan. With that, I would like to acknowledge the people who have contributed to this project. Uh, my mentor, Scott, our collaborator, Daniel, and our contributors, all the uh, members in the pleasure lab, and uh, funding resources. Uh, thanks to you for your attention, and I'll be taking your question at this time point. Thank you very much, Yang. Really super fascinating that it's you would think that it's the, um, the sugar that's causing this uh, difference, but it's not really. It's the, the oh, partially, method. yes. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. So I, I saw that Dario posted a question. It was actually the same that I had in mind. So does the choice of sugar or yeast uh, change as a function of age in the flies? Um, that's a great question. We haven't do any age specific measure of feeding. Um, we do that. But the observation is that flies start to die at really early ages, like two weeks. Um, so we don't know, we need to look at early ages is what I'm saying, but it's, yeah, it's, it's necessary to look at multiple uh, data points at this time. Mm. Right. Uh, another question from um, Andre that was just speaking prior. Uh, are micronutrients affected, uh, whether micronutrients affect food choice? Uh, we don't know about micronutrients. I that's the uh, text in the chat. No, do you mean it's macronutrients because that might affect food choice? But we absolutely know nothing about micronutrients uh, at this time point. Okay. Uh, another question from Dario. Uh, could the choice, I mean, the reason why we see this effect then in the choice, is it because it's some sort of stressful event per se? Um, that cost, costing, costful for the flies or what's that's, the that's, uh, Thanks. Yeah, uh, that's an excellent question. That is actually uh, what we want to prove in the paper, but it's highly speculate. We actually have some evidence that flies could be stressful. So there is a stress paradigm uh, in flies that if flies are stressful, they are going to consume more arsenal. So we did that essay, we exposed flies to choice for fixed doubts and flies pre exposed to choice doubts, they consume more arsenal, which as an indication, they are stressful. 
but we don't know for sure. It's just always hard to say that. And we also have evidence fines have uh, less triglycerides when they fed on choice and they live shorter in the stress resistant, uh, resistant experiments, which is also uh, consistent with this stress scenario, but we just don't know for sure. Yeah, that's what we want to uh, prove at some time point. Right, so is there any evidence for translational effects in other uh, models or even in mammals for this type of? Uh, there are lots of food choice experiments in mice, but not uh, regarding to aging, and we are cu curious to know that as well. Mm. So we have another question from Kershid Wani. Do you know how serotonin acts in the peripheral tissues? Is the peripheral tissue the intestine of flies? Uh, that's a very excellent question. That's something we want to do uh, in the next step. So we actually know uh, much clear uh, in say like elegance and uh, mice that the gut serotonin regulates uh, feeding and the physiology uh, and the metabolism. But we actually don't know much in flies. And there is some expression of the 5-HT um, uh, receptors in the gut, uh, but nobody knows it, the expression level is not super high and we don't have we don't know any function evidence about those, but that's what we want to know uh, next. Right, well, I guess, thank you very much, Yang. It was really, really a great talk. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, and with that, yes, I hand over to Dario to move on to introduce the next speaker. Yes. Thank you, Sarah. So our next speaker is uh, Huey Liang Zhang from the Department of uh, Medicine and Pathology, uh, University of Washington in the United States. And uh, the title of the talk is Reduction of Elevated Proton Leak Rejuvenates Mitochondria in the Aged Cardiomyocyte. Julian, uh, thank you for uh, presenting your work. We're looking forward to your presentation. Yeah. And as a general you. reminder, again, please do write uh, uh, questions in the chat if you have them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your introduction. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can yeah. see you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, for the organizer to give me this opportunity to introduce my work. Today, I'm going to tell you a story we published at the ELF Journal. Yeah. My, this story is about reduction of elevated proton leak and the rejuvenates of mitochondria in the aged cardiomyocyte. In the last century, 1950s, Dr. Durham Harman already proposed out the free radical theory of aging and later on going to mitochondria free radical theory of aging, but already 70 years passed. So far, no clinical drugs can treat the cardiac aging in the uh, uh, cl uh, clinical treatment. For our research, we focus on SS1 uh, peptide. In the clinical name is called elamipramitide. This SS31 is a small peptide, has four amino acids that can incorporate to cardiolipin which is abundant in the mitochondrial inner membrane and then can promote to keep mitochondrial curvature. Previously, our lab has found that we treatment the aged mice with SS31 by osmotic mini pump. We found eight week treatment can reverse the diastolic function in the aged mice also, eight-week treatment as a one can reverse the hypertrophy in the old mice. However, these observations are functional improvement. The mechanism needs to be further studied. In the mitochondria isolated from the heart, we find this this is young. This trace is from the old uh, mouse. We find 
to keep the same mitochondria member potential, we, the old mitochondria need more oxygen consumption. In other words, this means the old mitochondria has a decreased mitochondria proton coupling efficiency. That they will hypothesize that whether SS31 can improve the proton coupling efficiency and then subsequently rejuvenate the old mitochondria. To test this hypothesis, we isolated the cardiomyocyte and then do the seahorse mitochondrial stress assay and evaluate the proton leak in the mitochondria. We find old mitochondria has more proton leak and SS1 acute treatment, two hours of treatment on the isolated cardiomyocyte can reverse this increased proton leak. However, the oxygen consumption measurement of the proton leak is an indirect method. Then we developed a direct method to evaluate the proton leak by a mitochondrial targeted pH indicator. The, we over express the CPYP in the red cardiomyocyte for three days, then use spawning to formulate the cardiomyocyte. Then we expose the mitochondria to whatever pH we can add it to the external solution. As long as we lower the pH, we can see in the old mitochondria, when we lower the pH, the fluorescent goes down. That means the old mitochondria in the membrane are very uh, uh, like to resist to the pH stress. And in the young mitochondria, we can see the young mitochondria resistance very well to the pH stress. And SS31 treatment can make the old mitochondria go back to the young level of resistance to the pH stress. Because the pH stress, the fluorescence changed dramatically at pH 5.3, we focus on this pH for the uh, rest of the research. We can see at a pH 5.3, the fluorescence goes down most dramatically and SS31 treatment can restore it go to the young level. We also test the dose effect of SS31. We found SS1 can effective at very low dose going to 100 nanomolar. Moreover, we test the how fast of the SS1 can take its effect. We found SS1 treatment can effective at seven to 10 minutes reach a plateau of its effect. That is a phenomenon called a mitochondrial flash. This is a trusted increase of the mitochondrial signal also indicated by CPYP in a single mitochondria. You can see here, the arrow shows where the location of the fluorescent uh, the mitochondrial flash happened. This, we can see a trusted increase signal. And this are, there are three mitochondrial flashes in a single mitochondria. Recent study showed that the protons goes into the mitochondrial matrix through the inner membrane to can trigger the mitochondrial flashes. Then we hypothesis that whether the increase the mitochondrial proton leak can trigger more flashes. In line with the increase of mitochondrial proton leak, we see increase of mitochondrial flashes activity in the old cardiomyocyte and SS31 acute treatment can decrease this increase of mitochondrial activity. Next, we ask, where is the proton leak site? The protons in the mitochondrial inner membrane goes back to the mitochondrial matrix 
through the ATPase to generate ATP. Also, the proton leak back to the mitochondria matrix through ANT1, a dinucleotide translocator 1. This is a constitutive proton leak. Also, the protons go back to the matrix through a coupling protein 2, UCP2. This is regulated proton leak. So we use the inhibitors of this proton go back to matrix side and then to see which is the major proton leak site. We use ATPase inhibitor oclomycin A and ANT1 inhibitors bunkeric acid BKA all box attractor side CAT at UCP2 inhibitor genipine. We see this is a, a data. Yeah, ANT1 inhibitor, either BKA or CAT treatment can worse the proton leak and make the mitochondrial inner membrane resistant to the proton graded stress. But, but GNP, UCP inhibitor, or ATPase inhibitor or mass A, either of them does not re uh, restore the proton leak. This did indicated that the ANT1 is the major contributor of the proton leak in the aged mitochondria. In line with the, that, the ANT1 inhibitors, BK or CAT, decrease mitochondrial flash activity. Next, we asked. How does SCT1 can prevent the ANT1 mediated proton leak? Whether SCT1 can bind directly to the ANT1? Because SCT1 is a small peptide, it's very hard to do the polar experiment. We use biotin nylated SCT1, make SCT1 bind to biotin, and then Biotin can bind to the strep avidin using beads. We use this system to pull down the SCT1 binding proteins and then do rest blood to test whether we can see ANT1. We found biotin SCT1 can pull down ANT1. Also, SCT1 can compete with the biotin nylated SCT1. Moreover, ANT1 inhibitors, BK or CAT can partially prevent this binding. This data suggests SSD1 can bind directly to the ANT1 to prevent the proton leak. This data is supported by a recent published paper at PAAS by our collaborator Dave Masinik and Jim Bruce. They use the interactive uh, method to test SSD1 combining to the ANT1, the whole pocket of uh, the channel. Moreover, because ANT1 is a component of the ATP cisazone, we wonder why the SSD1 binds to ANT1 can make the ATP system more stable. What we did is prepare the mitochondria and then run the native gel and do rest blood of the ATP base. We find old mitochondria has lower ATP synthesis and SSS1 treatment can make it to the young level. <coughs> This is, <coughs> this is our working model. Old mitochondria has increased mitochondrial proton leak, and the proton leak is through the ANT1. SS31 combines directly to the ANT1 to prevent this proton leak and makes the mitochondria get less working load than to rejuvenate the mitochondria. I would like to thank my 
Mater Peter Rabinovich and my colleagues, also my uh, collaborators, Nathan Elder, also David Masnik and Wang Wang, also our collaborator, Hida Slater, who is the inventor of SS31. Our SS31 is provided by Stealth Biotherapeutic, and also thanks to the AHA Career Development Award to me and NRA grant to my matter. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to take questions. Thank you very much, Yuliang. Uh, this is fantastic work. We have a few questions from the uh, audience. So have you investigated SS31 in diabetic cardiomyopathy models? As I believe proton leak is increased in this condition due to an elevated fatty acid oxidation. Oh, yes. We uh, uh, did a custom model called uh, 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 Ross level uh, by the my two socks. We find uh, my two socks signal is decreased. That means the decreased Ross stress redox stress in the SS1 can decrease it in the age of the mitochondria. Thank you. So can you distinguish if the mitochondrial decline is the cause of the result of aging in cardiomyocyte? Oh, this is a great question. Uh, because uh, in the aged uh, in the aged heart, <clears throat> what we observed, the mitochondria <coughs> mass not decrease, but somehow a little bit uh, increase, but not reach a significant increase. So uh, we can uh, not see the decline. Um, we, based on the mass, we cannot tell. But for the function, uh, yes, the function is decreased. So I actually have a similar question. So is increased proton leak leakage with aging necessarily uh, pathogenic, dysfunctional, or could it be actually compensatory to some extent? Or this is completely uh, heretical? Oh, good. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there are, uh, that is a, uh, uh, that is a theory of pro, uh, by coupling to survival theory the uh, proposal to increase the proton leak to trigger, uh, make the less uh, stress of the mitochondria, then decrease the raw production. Yeah. Uh, that is majority happened in the physiology condition. Mm -hmm. What we think uh, we observe is at a pathology condition. At a pathology condition, increase too much our coupling is a Bad thing, but in a physiology condition, increase the coupling can that is benefit to the mitochondria. Are you able to measure heterogeneity and and uh, you know across different uh, cells during aging in uh, in uh, in uh, leakage? Probably yes, right. So you, with your imaging method, you should be able to to see how widespread or how concentrated in uh, uh, single fibers this phenomenon is during aging. Uh, uh, your question is uh, it's about uh, the population of the mitochondrial proton leak. Well, yeah, actually, uh, it's a, it's a very vague question. So it's both about you know within cell how heterogeneous is the coupling with aging, but also how, how many different fibers, muscle fibers, whether there is like a muscle fiber specific uh, uncoupling basically that occurs during aging. Sorry, this is a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, uh, it's not directly connected with uh, the impact of uh, SS SS31 with the ANT, but it's a more general curiosity. Huh. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe in the future we can uh, think out a method to evaluate. Yeah, thank you for this question. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank again Hugh Lang for its excellent talk and we can move on to the next speaker that I will thank hand you. over to uh, Sarah. Yes, thank you all for staying with us. It's been super interesting so far. So we have two more talks to go and we are even before schedule, I think. So that's great. So I will introduce 
the next speaker, uh, Karen Krukowski from UCSF, University of California, San Francisco in the United States. So thank you for joining us. I guess it's early morning for you. Uh, and the title of your talk is Small Molecule Cognitive Enhancer Reverses Age-Related Memory Decline in Mice. And we can see your presentation. So welcome and please go ahead, Karen. Hi, thank you so much, Sarah. I'm excited to present today. Um, so I wanted to tell you about a story that started as a collaboration between Susanna Rossi, shown here, and Peter Walter, who wanted to investigate if interference with the integrated stress response could affect memory loss. So I'll just give you a very brief, brief background on what the integrated stress response or ISR is. It is a universal intracellular stress pathway that responds to a number of different cellular stressors, some of which are listed here, that results in phosphorylation of a transla translation initiation factor EIF2. And this ultimately leads to decreased protein translation with a small subset of stress mediated proteins upregulated. So I like to think of this system as our body's fire alarm system. When there is an immediate threat, we, the system reacts through phosphorylation of EIF2 and there's this shutdown of the system. Obviously, this is really important if there's an immediate threat like a fire, but the problem becomes if the system remains upregulated for too long. And so what was previously shown was that if the system remains upregulated for too long, it can result in some memory problems. So the question became, is there a way to briefly interfere with this system to try to mediate some of these long-term negative effects? And prior to my time in the labs, uh, members of Peter Walter's lab discover, discovered a drug, the Integrated Stress Response Inhibitor, or ISRIB, that could briefly interfere with this system. It acted downstream of phosphorylation of EIF2 and was able to briefly interrupt this stress system. So we wanted to see, could we use this inhibitor to mediate memory loss? And the first system we looked at was models of traumatic brain injury. And I'm not going to discuss these studies in detail today, although I'm happy to answer questions on them either at the end or by email. But the main takeaway from these studies is that we used a variety of mouse models and found that brief ISRIB treatment could reverse long-term trauma-induced cognitive and behavioral changes. So we were able to administer ISRIB briefly to the mice and see long-term changes in both their memory loss and other behavioral paradigms. So the next paradigm we decided to look at was healthier normal aging. And it's been hypothesized by others that traumatic brain injury or TBI is a model of accelerated aging. So if it truly is a model of accelerated aging, we would expect similar mechanism to underlie the deficits we see in both, such as memory loss. And we would expect that therapeutics such as, such as ISRIB that was effective in reversing trauma-induced memory loss could also reverse age-induced memory loss. So we decided to test this in a mouse model in which we administered ISRIB to young and old mice and we measured memory loss using the radial arm water maze. I have a cartoon depiction of what the radial arm water maze looks like here. And what you see is a large pool filled with water with eight arms. In one of these eight arms, there is a platform that is submerged just below the surface of the water. It allows the animal to escape the water, but is not visible to the animal. Over a period of several days, we train the animal to locate this escape platform using visual cues placed throughout the room. This is similar to how when you navigate your way home at night, you use street signs or buildings in order to know where to turn in order to find your way home. So it's commonly used as a measure of spatial learning and memory deficits. So for this trial, what we did is we trained the mice over a period of several days to find this escape platform. During that training, the mice received ISRIB injections. This is the exact same paradigm we used in our trauma studies in which there were three injections of ISRIB, and then we test memory deficits later. And so we looked on day 10 to see if the animals 
could locate that escape platform. And in order to quantify performance in this tool, we count the number of incorrect turns the animal makes prior to finding the escape platform. So every time the mouse turns into an arm that does not have the escape platform, it is counted as an error. So more errors is poorer performance in the tool. So when we looked at young and old male mice, we see that old male mice perform worse in the tool, making more errors when compared with our young mice. This was not new, this has been shown previously. But was, what was very exciting to us was that when we administered ISRIB to old mice, we see that they perform at levels comparable to our young mice. So the, is, the brief ISRIB administration is reversing this age-induced phenotype. So I mentioned this was in old male mice. We also looked in old female mice and we see an identical pattern where ISRIB administration reverses this age-induced deficit. So we're able to see the potential for ISRIB to reverse age-induced memory decline. We then wanted to look to see how long do the effects of ISRIB administration last? So as you'll remember, we were testing the radial arm water maze at day 10. So we decided to keep the mice alive and continue out later. So starting on day 20, we introduced the mice to a different behavioral paradigm, the delayed matching to place Barnes maze. This is a top-down view of this behavioral paradigm. It's a large table with 40 holes. In one of the 40 holes is an escape tunnel that allows the mouse to get off of the table. Similar to the radial on water maze, the mouse uses clues throughout the room in order to navigate its way to the escape tunnel. However, unlike the radial arm water maze, we change the location of this escape tunnel each day, making it very difficult for the mice. And it is a task that's known to be very difficult for age mice with them seeing little to no improvement. And this is exactly what we saw. Our old mice shown in the light blue here, um, show almost no improvement over our four testing days. We're measuring the time it takes the animal to find the escape tunnel. And you can see from day 20 to day 23, the mean average of the group remains about the same. What was exciting to us is when we look at our mice that received ISRIB, now they received ISRIB 20 days prior, there were no additional injections administered during this behavioral paradigm. We see that their performance is improving over the four days so that by the fourth day, they're performing the tool at a significantly faster rate than their matched age counterparts. So now we're really able to see the long lasting effects of this brief ISRIB treatment in our aged animals. So next we wanted to look at how is ISRIB doing this? And the first thing we wanted to look at is neuronal function. And we decided to begin looking at this um, during ISRIB administration. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Um, the first is that this is when we first started to measure behavioral differences. We wanted to look within the hippocampus, which is one of the brain regions that is known to control learning and memory. And we did some electrophysi electrophysiology on these animals. Um, and this was done by Amber Nolan, a former postdoc in Susanna's lab, who has since left the lab and started her own lab at the University of Washington. Um, and I should say that Amber did a lot of work and a lot of recordings on these animals, but I'm just going to show you the one where we measured age differences and ISRIB differences. So we looked at the after hyperpolarization amplitude. And what we're looking at here is following a series of spikes, we look at the amplitude of after hyperpolarization zoomed in here. What was known prior to this study is that young animals have a low after hyperpolarization, whereas old animals have a larger after hyperpolarization. And this can affect subsequent intrinsic excitability in the animals. And what was exciting to us is what we found is that during ISRIB administration, that old animals that received ISRIB, this after hyperpolarization amplitude was reversed to levels equivalent to young mice. So similar to what we saw in the behavioral paradigms, we're seeing that ISRIB is able to reverse this age-induced phenotype um, to levels similar to our young mice. So having seen these differences in neuronal function, we next wanted to look at neuronal structure. And this was done by a graduate student in the lab, Alma Frias, who I'll tell you a little bit more about later in the talk. 
Um, so Alma was looking at neuronal structure, specifically she was looking at dendritic spines. And again, we're looking at the hippocampus in the same region that Amber was doing recordings. And we're able to use um, fluorescent mice that have excitatory neurons labeled. And so we can identify these spines of, on dendritic length. And so what we measured was a density. So the number of spines we counted within a dendritic length. And what is known is that with age, we see a reduction in the number of spines um, in the hippocampus. And what Elma found is that when we give Isrib to these mice, we see an alleviation of this age-induced reduction in dendritic spines. So unlike the behaviors and the electrophysiology, we're not seeing a return to young levels, but we are seeing an alleviation with Isrib administration. So we're able to identify the fact that ISRIB is able to change neuronal functional and uh, morphological changes. Uh, previously, we've shown this in traumatic brain injury. Here, we're showing it in normal or healthy aging. So next, we decided to ask, does ISRIB administration have any effect on immune cells? And initially, we looked at microglia in the hippocampus, as these are the main immune cells in the brain. And we didn't see any differences between young and old mice. And so, excuse me, we didn't see any differences between old mice plus or minus ISRIB. So around this time, a paper came out from a group down at Stanford that with age, there's an infiltration of T cells into the brain. So we decided to look at if we see this in the hippocampus and if ISRIB is able to affect this. And so using qPCR analysis, we looked at a T cell marker, CD3. And what we did see is that with age, there is a significant increase in this T cell marker in the hippocampus of our old mice. And that when we administered ISRIB to these old mice, we see that this age-induced increase is reduced to levels comparable to our young mice. And what was also striking to us about this is that this impact of ISRIB on T cell levels was not solely seen in the brain. We also saw it in the blood of these old mice where ISRIB, ISRIB administration reduced T cell levels. So what could T cells be doing when they enter the brain of aged mice? It's not exactly teased out in aging, but in other models uh, such as viral infection models, it's been shown that when T cells infiltrate the brain, they can influence cognitive function through production of interferon cytokines, so inflammatory cytokines. So we decided to look at these with age, and we also decided to look to see if ISRIB could affect interferons. And so I'm not gonna show you the graphs today, but I've listed some of the interferon response genes we looked at here. And what we did see is an age effect where we saw increased interferon responses, and these responses were reversed with ISRIB administration. But what was equally exciting to us is that we saw these significant positive correlations between T cell markers, interferon response genes, and uh, cognitive performance in the radio arm learning maze. What does this mean? This means that animals who have less T cell markers in the brain have less interferon response genes and perform better or make less errors prior to finding the escape platform whereas animals with higher T cell levels have higher interferon response genes and make more errors when locating the escape platform in the radial arm water maze. So we're really starting to tease out and define this potential mechanism of T cells in the aging brain and the effect that ISRIB can have on these molecules. Okay, so I've been able to show you that ISRIB administration affected long-term learning and memory loss. We see changes in neuronal uh, function. We see changes in neuronal structure and we see changes in immune cell function. But what if we look more molecularly inside the cell? I mentioned before that we know that ISRIB acts downstream of phosphorylation of EIF2. So can we see the effects of ISR activation in the brain following ISRIB administration? In order to do this, we looked at ATF4 levels in the brain. 
And as expected with age, we see an increase in ATF4 levels. And when we administered ISRIB to these old mice, we see that this age-induced increase in ATF4 levels is reversed to levels of young mice. What was even more striking to us is that although ISRIB acts downstream of phosphorylation of EIF2, we wanted to see if there was a potential feedback loop and if ISRIB could be resetting this ISR activation. And this is in fact what we saw. When we looked at old mice plus or minus ISRIB, we see that the old mice that received ISRIB had reduced phosphorylation of EIF2, suggesting that ISRIB is able to reset this ISR related, this age related ISR activation. So in conclusion, we were able to see that brief ISRIB treatment, just three injections could re rescue age-induced cognitive decline in mice. We saw it in male and female mice, and we saw it lasting for weeks after administration. When we looked mechanistically at what ISRIB was doing, we see that it improves neuronal function, specifically intrinsic neuronal excitability. We saw that it increased enteric spine density, it reversed age-induced changes in T-cell and interferon responses in both the, the brain as well as in the blood. And we also saw a reversal or a resetting of ISR activation. Um, and this was the work that we did. There's been a number of other groups that have looked at the ISR, the integrated stress response as a main mediator of cognitive health. And what is beginning to become an emerging picture is that regulation of the ISR could be important for mediating a number of different cognitive decline states. And then just finally, I wanted to share some exciting updates from the lab. Um, the patent rights of ISRIB are owned by Calico, a company um, located in South San Francisco, and they recently released that an ISRIB derivative is currently in phase one clinical trials and is expected to move into phase two clinical trials later in this year. So this would be in, this is in clinical trials for ALS patients, but it is exciting to see the potential of manipulation of the integrated stress response as a therapeutic for regulating memory loss. And I am um, no longer in the Rossi lab. I have moved on to my next position, um, but I did wanna highlight some of the future directions as to where this study will be going. Um, I mentioned earlier in the talk that Alma Frias, who's a graduate student in Susanna's lab, um, did the spine density work. Well, Alma is continuing to look at the spine dynamics and how ISRIB affects spine dynamics. So when we look at spine density, we're looking at a single snapshot of what is happening at this single time point. And what Alma is doing is, can she look at spine changes over time in a live animal? And can she see how ISRIB affects these spine changes? And her work is very exciting. And I would say, look for this coming out, hopefully in the next year. Um, and another postdoc in Peter Walter's lab is looking into the cell specificity of ISRIB. So we showed that ISRIB is able to affect neurons, but we wanted to, we're wondering, is there a specific subset of neurons? Are there specific brain regions that ISRIB um, predominantly affects? And this is what Morgan Boone in Peter Lauder, Walter's lab is working on. So I just wanted to show you all of the individuals involved in this study. This, these are the members of the Rossi lab and the Walter lab. Um, some of the authors aren't pictured here. And then of course, our funding sites. So with that, I can take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Karen. Really, really interesting. We have some questions in the chat. Uh, so we can start with one here. How long lasting is the inhibition of ISR using ISRIB? And could there be any long-term costs to inhibiting ISR using ISRIB? Yeah, great question. Um, so we haven't looked to see how long lasting the um, downregulation of the phosphorylation of EIF2 is. I can tell you that in the aging study, we see that the brief ISRIB administration lasts for three, we see cognitive changes lasting for three weeks. In one of our trauma models, we see behavioral changes lasting for three months. So we do think that there are long lasting changes with ISRIB administration. 
As far as the cost of interfering with the ISR long-term, I think this is a great question because obviously the ISR is a critical cellular pathway. We wouldn't want to permanently shut it down. And that is where um, some of the pharmacokinetics of ISRIB are interesting, where we've been able to find that the mechanism, and I'm not going to dive into this too much because this really isn't my area of expertise, but we found that ISRIB interferes with intermediate levels of ISR activation. So if there's a very high ISR activation, ISRIB is not able to inhibit it. Um, so it's really working in this intermediate state, suggesting that hopefully we wouldn't see any deleterious effects. And to date, we haven't seen any in our mouse models. Okay. Uh, and the follow-up question here then, also are mice able to elicit ISR after being treated with ISRIB? if they find themselves in a very stressful scenario in which the activation of ISR would be beneficial? Yeah, so um, we haven't specifically tested that in our mouse model, um, but yes, we believe so. And I think actually this brings up a good point from the trauma studies. And one of the directions that we wanted to go is when we look at the trauma studies, we do ingle, either a single or a multiple trauma model, and then we administer ISRIB later. What we haven't looked at yet, but I know um, they want to in the future is, what if that mouse then receives another trauma after receiving ISRIB? Is there any protection there? Or likewise, if they received another insult, how would ISRIB affect that? And we just haven't looked at it yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, some more questions here. ISRIB seems to elicit different responses in old mice. There is heterogeneity in the responses among mice, better and worse responders. Do better performers also have more young looking AHB? I don't um, know ask this, yeah. Um, so we do see a lot of heterogeneity in just old mice that haven't received ISRIB. There is a lot of heterogeneity um, in the old mice. I don't have a lot of explanation for why that is, as these mice are genetically identical, they're bred together and they've lived in the same facility for the entirety of their 18 months of age. Um, but I think that it is just organismal differences that we see. Um, and I think we see that same heterogeneity reflected in the mice that receive ISRIB. Um, we have not, we do see the correlations between um, T cells, interferons, and um, cognitive performance. We haven't looked at the electrophysiology or the spine dynamics in relationship to cognitive performance there. I think that's what the AHB is in that question. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think similar to what we see in humans, there's heterogeneity with aging, and we see that mimicked in our old mice as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one more question. Are the cytokines responses in old plus ISRIB also changing in a young looking manner in the blood? In other words, is the immune phenotype in the brain organ specific or does it rather reflect systemic changes in immune profiles? Yeah, I think that's a great question because one of the reasons we started to look at the T cells in the blood is could we identify a biomarker for an individual who, who would be at risk for cognitive decline and aging? Um, and we haven't looked at the cytokine profiles in the blood, but I think that's a really great point. Um, we're still kind of looking to see if we can identify a true biomarker for this. But so I don't know for the cytokines yet, but hopefully soon. And I think that's a great question. So uh, one more thing I was thinking about is this ISR um, system uh, response uh, responsible also for other aging or not aging but brain health effects so for example in burnout situations where you have a long chronic stressful situation is this system also in, in activation and could you then inhibit that with this is rib functions um i i mean for stress conditions yes we usually do see isr activation we haven't looked at it but i do think um, a system where we're seeing this kind of chronic low-grade activation of ISR, yes, I think ISRIB could interfere with it and then could reverse some of the detrimental consequences that we see. So it's not really aging specific, it's more about um, the mechanisms. 
Okay. Yeah, and that's where that review from um, Peter and Mauro really talks about a number of different uh, degenerative states where they're seeing that ISR activation occurs and that using some sort of interference with the ISR pathway can alleviate in some way these different or these different states. So I do think we are um, moving towards a better understanding of maybe the ISR is this pathway that is common between a lot of different degenerative states. And we've shown it in trauma and aging, but a number of others have shown it in um, most recently, it was shown in Alzheimer's disease as well. Hmm. Great. So that, I think that was a great ending for this uh, discussion. So thank you so much, Karen. Super interesting. Thank and you. Then uh, move on to the last talk of today. So uh, let's see. Gara, are you there? Yeah. Hi, Sora. Yes. Hi. Welcome. So the, our last speaker is Gada Al Saleh from the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology, University of Oxford in the UK. So the title of your talk is Autophagy as a pathway to rejuvenate immune responses. Yes. Uh, thank you, Sara, uh, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I would like also to thank Eli for organizing this symposium and to give me this opportunity uh, to present my work. And as you mentioned, it would be about autophagy and uh, regenerate immune response. Uh, so as you all know that one of the great transformation of our society is the increased number of people who are aged than more 60 years old. And of course, this great uh, um, achievement of increased lifespan is affected by the increased number of people who suffer from one or several age-related disease. And this is open a new challenge in front of us to understand uh, the mechanism of aging and its process. And actually scientists do make a great effort to understand what is the mechanism of aging. And they propose to us um, nine uh, candidates uh, that contribute to aging and uh, all together could uh, determine the uh, aging phenotype, which we can generally classify in uh, three groups. The first one, which is the molecular alternation, and uh, this uh, considered as uh, the primary cause of aging. And this, of course, leads to the cellular dysfunction, and uh, which uh, finally result in uh, the tissue damage. All these factors together lead to increase the risk of developing or um, inducing uh, uh, many uh, age-related disease. And actually autophagy, which is uh, the, degrad the main degradation and recycle pathway in the cells, seem to be situated in uh, the heart of uh, aging mechanism. It's linked to all this factor directly or indirectly. We know that autophagy level is full with age, and that's lead to increase the SAS, the senescence associated secretory phenotype, uh, several cytokines such as AL1 beta, TNF alpha. It's also um, increased uh, is, um, uh, the uh, damage of uh, mitochondria damage and uh, increase ROS reduction. Of course, this uh, have also great impact on uh, the DN damage. On the other side, when we uh, overexpress the gene of autophagy, we can increase the lifespan in mice. And the treatment uh, with rapamycin or the color restriction also increase lifespan in different spicy and autophagy dependent manner. So we know that autophagy is reduced with age, while the immune senescence is increased with age. So the immune senescence is a series of uh, function decline with age in the immune system, including the uh, increase of inflammation, or most likely we all we call it also inflammatory aging. We have um, the increased number of macrophages, neutrophils. However, we have a lack of their function. In addition to that, we have also decrease in naive T and B cells, and also a decrease in uh, memory of T and B cells for a new antigen. So all these factors lead to a compromised immune response against infection and uh, vaccination, as we witnessed today with the pandemic um, of COVID-19. So in our lab, we wanted to study and to understand 
the role uh, between autophagy and immune synthesis. Uh, so to assess this, um, we inhabit uh, first autophagy uh, specifically in T cells. As you can see here, we, inhibit, we use uh, ATG7, which is a gene for autophagy. And actually, Dan, who was a PhD in our lab in his ELIFE paper in 2015, showed that um, and if we take these um, uh, knockout mice uh, in T cells specifically and infect them with a flu, we have a normal uh, response to uh, a flu infection, uh, however, a normal uh, effectory response. However, we have a decreased uh, response, as you can see here, in the memory response. And these uh, uh, effects seem to be uh, mimic what we find in aging. As you can see here, when we also infect mice with the flu, we have a normal effectory response of CD8 T cells. However, we have a, a compromise of uh, CD8 memory response. So we can see that there might be a correlation between the phenotype aging and autophagy. So we wanted, uh, or Dan wanted to in, in induce uh, autophagy using uh, spermidine, which is a natural polyamine. Um, it's synthesis by uh, the eukaryote cells. And we can also take it from uh, the netto or uh, uh, blue cheese and other food. So uh, when we treat spermidine uh, when, uh, to these old mice, uh, we give it in water uh, over all the experiments. And we could find that actually when we give spermidine to these mice, we increase um, uh, the, uh, the response of the effectory response and also specifically the memory response of T cells to uh, the flu infection. So I wondered what is all the case then? What is the role of autophagy during um, human, uh, during the uh, uh, vaccination in human cells? So if, uh, to assess this, um, we tried to get some uh, sample uh, from vaccinated trial and we could first get a, a different uh, sample from um, hepatitis C um, trial where uh, you can see we have uh, several time points and then we measure autophagy in, in these cells using a fax assay. Uh, this uh, assay has been developed in our lab uh, using different primary uh, cells uh, to validate it and then uh, we apply this in uh, uh, the sample of from uh, uh, the vaccine. What was interesting, as you can see here, that autophagy was induced specifically in the uh, HCV specific CD8 T cells, and uh, but not in the non-specific cells. And this effect was reduced in the end of uh, the study. So this might show that there is a role important, or autophagy might be important in uh, the response to a vaccination. But as I mentioned before, that the vaccination is most likely affected in uh, the elderly. I wanted to study, and we want to study, what is um, uh, the role of autophagy uh, between um, and compare it between old and young. So we uh, get sample from RSV uh, trial. It's a respiratory synthetical viruses, which have sometimes uh, um, a serious effect in um, uh, uh, the elderly. And we compare, uh, we measure autophagy in the blood, in the CDT uh, cells in uh, these um, uh, uh, vaccines. And as you can see here that uh, autophagy was reduced in the elderly compared to the young people. But the most interesting thing is that actually autophagy was correlated with interferon gamma response in the elderly and not in the young which means that autophagy might be uh, important for uh, the secretion of interferon gamma. And to study this, we um, uh, take uh, uh, CDT cells from mice where we inhibit autophagy. Uh, 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 it's, um, of course, knockout for autophagy um, in T cells. And as you can appreciate this, here, after activation of these cells for three days with CD3, CD28, we can see that the secretion of interferon gamma is dramatically decreased uh, in the supernatum and also in uh, the cells, intracellular staining by fax. Um, moreover, we also find that the peripherine, which is um, uh, important for the cytotoxicity 
of uh, T cells and their function was also uh, reduced in these cells. We uh, uh, find the same uh, data after we uh, activated uh, cells of, from a human uh, sample from young people and um, we inhibit uh, autophagy using two different inhibitor, the hydrochloroquine, uh, which inhibit um, the fusion of autophagy with lysosome and SPE1, SPE, which an inhibitor of ULK1, uh, it's uh, in the initiation of um, autophagy. And as you can see here, uh, anterfugal gamma secretion also was reduced in the cyprinotin and inside the cells, and also peripherin was reduced. So I would, we wanted to see if we could increase the autophagy by adding spermidine. Are we going to uh, uh, improve uh, CDT cells function? Spermidine was reduced with age. We measured this in uh, different uh, PPMCs from uh, different uh, uh, people, uh, different age, and we found that spermidine was reduced. So when we added uh, to uh, the cells, uh, of uh, um, cell of T cells, of course, they were as uh, isolated uh, from elderly, and then they activated uh, for several days, adding spermidine to them. As you can appreciate here, that uh, interferon gamma secretion was increased in the supernatant and also intracellular by facts, and the peripheral was increased. On the other hand, when we inhibit autophagy. Spermidine was unable to induce and improve uh, T cells response. We, um, we have uh, actually uh, recently identified how spermidine regulate autophagy. And, uh, and Hanan, who was also a PhD student in our lab, identified the mechanism. Uh, those spermidine have been uh, used uh, since several years, but uh, the, the uh, correct or the, uh, the mechanism of how spermidine induced autophagy was still unknown. So Hanin showed that a spermidine induced the hypocination of AFAB, which is a translational factor. And uh, this hypocination is amino acid exists for the moment only um, known to be exist in this uh, specific protein, AFAB. And the role of the hypocination is to facilitate the translational of a three proline a multiple protein. And one of these protein is TFIP. Uh, TFIP is the master regulator of autophagy and lysosome. So we find that spermidine is important for the hypocination of TFIP. That's lead to induce, uh, to induce TFIP and TFIP is important for autophagy and autophagy was important for B uh, cells response. So I wanted to know if uh, this mechanism also is the same uh, mechanism that spermidine induce autophagy in T cells. So to do this, I take a blood from uh, uh, BBMCs from all donor and uh, we uh, uh, inhibit uh, spermidine using the FMO. This is inhibiting the uh, endogenic sper uh, spermidine we inhibit the synthesis inside the cells. And as you can see here, that we could uh, decrease um, at the hypocination and also TFAP level in, in the cells. However, when we supplement uh, spermidine again in the supernatant, we could increase the hypocination and the TFAP expression. And then you can appreciate here the quantification of this Western blood. On the other hand, in the elderly, uh, when we take the blood, we have already a decrease of hypocination and a TFAP level in their um, uh, uh, BPMCs and T cells. So when we add spermidine to it, we could enhance and induce um, uh, a TFAP expression and the hypocination. So we, um, we find that spermidine mode of action is uh, via the hypocination of TFAP and um, uh, 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 the hypocination of, of AFAB and inducing TFAB. However, is TFAB important for um, uh, T cells um, uh, uh, response? To answer this question, we uh, use cells uh, where they were uh, knocked out for uh, TFAB and we activate them uh, for several days with CD3, CD28. 
And we look at the secretion of interferon gamma and periphery. And as you can appreciate here, we can find that the interferon gamma uh, was reduced in the cells and the periphery. And however, when we supplement uh, spermidine, we were unable to uh, resecure uh, the uh, secretion of interferon gamma or the production of uh, periphery. So in summary, uh, we find that uh, the uh, uh, that DFIP expression was reduced with age, and that's lead to increase of autophagy, which lead to increase the immune senescence in T cells, and that have a great impact on the response to vaccination in the elderly. So in this, we cover a new drug uh, target that we might be uh, used to enhance uh, vaccination efficacy in the future. I would like to thank you for your listening, uh, and I'd like to uh, thank all our uh, group. We were seem to be all happy when we still meeting all again face to face. Hopefully, this will come again. Uh, I would like to uh, thank specifically Isabel and Hanen, who uh, participate in this work, and all our collaborator. And I'm happy to have your question. Thank you, Gada. Really, really nice presentation and very um, topical right now, I guess, with talking upon the pandemic. Uh, so we have a question here from Dario. Is the change in autophagal levels between young and old mice cell specific or is it a bulk measure? Because there could perhaps be differences in amounts of T cells between young and old um, mice. Yeah, so actually we look at it separately and in the whole uh, cells. So even if you look at specifically B cells or uh, specifically T cells, we find that uh, in mice and also in human, we could find that autophagy with age is, re is reduced. So it's not a bulk. It's really like if you look at the bulk, you have this reduction, but also yeah. if you look separately, uh, autophagy was reduced also. Mm. Oh, great. Did you just look at that? Uh, and actually, sorry, I just want to mention that um, autophagy seemed to be start to be reduced around 60, 65 years old. And also TFib, uh, this uh, protein, the master regulation of autophagy is also dramatically re reduced after 65. So we could easily distinguish people aging uh, just from um, how much they have uh, TFib in their blood. And also this is dependent T cells or B cells. Okay, right. And is that, uh, have you pooled the, the cells from um, both um, men and women? Or have you looked at sex specific effects? No, this is was like uh, independent of sex, whatever it is. Yeah. Right. Uh, there is one more question from Dario. Is autophagy involved or necessary for T cell receptor assembly? Uh, you mean for the priming? Is that his question, I think? Dario, you yes, jump in. exactly. Yeah, so this is something we are trying actually to uh, answer because we are studying also um, uh, uh, the, the, the effect uh, in uh, uh, role of autophagy in CD4 and CD8. So in CD8, I remember that Dan was looking if the cells were a defect in uh, primary, but this is, was not the case because he used actually a chimera mouse where he mixed the knockout with uh, the, the white type. And then he could distinguish that is not actually the lymphobenia because of course you will have lymphobenia when you have a, a deficiency with autophagy was not the primary because uh, uh, of course in these uh, T cells mice model, when you use the CD4, you inhibit it in T and for uh, CD4 and CD T cells. Uh, however, now we are working in a project in CD4 uh, uh, T cells, and we are investigating if autophagy are important for the prime. If is it really the priming or after after that? Very interesting. Okay, one more question just came in here. Uh, the TFEB also plays a role in aging. Could you speculate whether? TFEB's role in immune response that you showed could be linked to its role in aging. 
Yes, of course. I think I think that DFib might be um, used as a, a new um, biomarker for aging because uh, DFib have been also studied in different age-related diseases, especially uh, neurodegenerative disease. Of course, we need more study um, to show if it's a biomarker. But uh, what we are working now, uh, we are trying actually to find a drug which enhance this um, expression on TFIP. And I know that several actually company uh, trying to use um, adenoviruses or um, like uh, drugs specific to TFIP to, uh, to enhance uh, uh, and improve uh, the age related disease. So that would be interesting to follow up then to see how, how that goes. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I we will get some data at the end of this year. We are gonna, we are doing. Actually, I'm doing some of um, CRISPR screen uh, to find what is the um, regulator of TFib, why TFib is really, really reduced, and it seems to be like a translational, um, uh, in a translational level. And on the other hand, we are we are trying to find a drug to enhance uh, this pathway. Very interesting. So thank you very much, Gada. Really nice discussion thank and talk. Thank you. It was nice to meet you all. <laughs> so you. I think with that, Dario, we've... Um... Yeah, I think we think the symposium is, uh, has come to an end. So well, we'd like to thank everybody uh, at eLife and uh, all the speakers and the participants. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all for attending and bringing up interesting questions and for staying on the whole afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you.